Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1187, with a release and air date of Saturday, November 27th, 2021. Please take the program to your air following the Q tone. Coming up on our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world in 2022, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1187 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The organizers of the Dayton Hamvention are cautiously expecting the gathering to be a live in-person event in 2022. The FCC gives its official thumbs up for the first FM-capable 11-meter radios for a manufacturer in the United States. The fall ARRL section manager election results have been announced and we will have all of them for you. The International Amateur Radio Union gives its highest honor to three amateurs for their leadership. Young amateur operators all around the world are gearing up for Youngsters on the Air Month coming up in December. Amateur Radio Digital Communications gives a grant to Haiti and also a grant to the U.S. Virgin Island Amateurs. We will have all the details and what the projects are entailing. Registration is now open for the 2022 AWRL National Convention coming up at the Orlando Hamcation in February. And did you know that a member of the band Blur is an amateur? Well, he is, and he just signed an exciting new recording contract. We will introduce you to him and tell you about his exciting new solo album in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, is on vacation this week, and Rich DeMuro, the technology reporter from KTLA in Los Angeles, will be sitting in, and he will talk about online assistant privacy and a lot more. Australia's own Anil Benshoff, VK6FLAB, takes a look at what he calls the rebirth of home brewing. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill continues his in-depth look at the technician class licensee during the 50s and 60s. And, as our Thanksgiving week present to you, we will have an interview with the late Art Bell, W6OBB, conducted by the QSO Today podcast's own Eric Guth, 4Z1UG. All of that and a lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. And reporting from our snowy headquarters studios, where, yes, it snowed all day yesterday, and we've got more than a foot of what they call upsloping snow, somewhere in the vicinity of Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where it's almost the perfect temperature for the rain to turn to ice on the trees, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from the Western Catskills of upstate New York, where it's snow and fit to beat the band outside on a Thanksgiving weekend, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where with tummies full of Thanksgiving goodies, we're all settling down to a long winter's night. And I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. I think Will had a little bit too much turkey. The tryptophan kicked in. Hey, Will, wake up. And now with this week's lead story, here's Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week, Dayton Hamvention organizers are cautiously planning to mount the first in-person show in 2022 following two years of COVID-related cancellations. 
The event is set for May 20th to the 22nd at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. Last January, Hamvention organizers from the sponsoring Dayton Amateur Radio Association announced they were calling off the 2021 event after considerable planning was already underway. The Hamvention Executive Committee cited lagging COVID-19 vaccine distribution in the U.S. and the emergence of a more communicable form of the virus. Southgate Amateur Radio News quotes Hamvention General Chairman Rick Allnett, WS8G, as saying that Hamvention committees have been meeting and volunteers are committed to making up for the time lost to pandemic cancellations. The Hamvention website is already accepting bookings from vendors and inside exhibitors, and individual visitors can already buy tickets, which Allnett said are all printed and ready to go. Nominations for the 2022 Hamvention Awards opened on November 1st. Hamvention seeks the best of the best nominees for its Technical Achievement, Special Achievement, Amateur of the Year, and Club of the Year awards. Nominations close on February 15, 2022. Submit nomination forms via email or USPS to Hamvention Awards Committee, Box 964, Dayton, Ohio, 45401-0964. Again, Hamvention Awards Committee, Box 964, Dayton, Ohio, 45401-0964. Contest University will take place on May 19th in conjunction with the annual Hamvention Super Suite activities, which will be moving to the Hope Hotel in Dayton. In addition to Contest University, these activities will include the Top Band Dinner, the Contest Dinner, and the KC DX Club's CW Copying Competition, among other possible events. We will keep an eye on this story as new COVID variants encompass the planet. The United States could soon be seeing its first FM-capable citizens' band radios coming to a store near you. The FCC has given its first thumbs up for the manufacture of an FM-capable citizens' band radio in the U.S. market. President Electronics of Naples, Florida, was given the go-ahead to introduce the model known as the President Thomas to consumers in the United States. Authorization was granted on November 10th, allowing the operation between 26.965 MHz and 27.405 MHz with a maximum output of 4 watts. The FCC acted after the radio was certified by Timco Engineering, a Florida company under contract to act on the agency's behalf. This brings to market the first 11-meter all-mode transceivers. This past summer, the FCC approved FM as an option for Citizens Band users. The post seen on the SW Elling website said that it was unclear how soon the radios might be in distribution. Satellite trackers have been working overtime to figure out just how much dangerous debris Russia created when it destroyed one of its own satellites early last Monday, the 22nd of November. And the picture they painted looks bleak. Multiple visual simulations of Russia's anti-satellite or ASAT test show a widespread cloud of debris which will likely menace other objects in orbit for years. Earlier this week, Russia launched a missile that destroyed the country's Cosmos 1408 satellite, a large spacecraft that orbited the Earth roughly 300 miles up. The breakup of the satellite created at least 1,500 pieces of trackable fragments, according to the US State Department, as well as thousands of smaller pieces that are too small to be tracked. All of those pieces are still in low Earth orbit, moving at thousands of miles an hour and posing a threat to any objects that might cross their path. Initially, even the International Space Station was considered to be under threat of a collision, with crew members on board forced to take shelter in their spacecrafts as the debris cloud from the satellite passed by the ISS a couple of times. Well, if you want to find out more, seek out the story at www.theverge.com. The only contested seat for a section manager in the fall election cycle was in Kansas, where incumbent Ron Cowan, KB0DTI, came out on top in a two-person race. Cowan outpolled challenger Lloyd Colston of Arkansas City, 260 to 225. Ballots were counted on November 23rd at ARRL headquarters. Cowan has served as Kansas section manager since 2003. His new two-year term will begin January 1st of 2022. In Alabama, Roger Parsons, KK4UDU of Mulga, will become the new section manager January 1. Parsons was the only nominee for the position. 
He'd been an assistant section manager and a district emergency coordinator. Incumbent section manager Yvonne Martin, W4JVM, has served as the Alabama section manager since 2016, has decided not to run for a new term. In Michigan, Les Butler, W8MSP of Gregory, will become the new section manager of Michigan when the new year arrives. He was the only section manager nominee to submit a petition by the nomination deadline. Butler will succeed incumbent Michigan section manager Jim Kovochik, K8JK, whose job will take him out of state early next year. Kovochik had been Michigan section manager since 2018. In Delaware, the section manager position remains open, and a re-solicitation for nominees will be issued in this winter for the 18-month term, beginning on July 1, 2022. No nominating petitions were submitted before the deadline in September. Incumbent section manager Mark Stillman, KA3JUJ, is moving out of the section early next year and could not run for another term after serving as Delaware section manager since 2020. These incumbent section managers faced no opposition and were declared elected for new terms. David Stevens, KL7EB in Alaska. Mike Patterson, N6JGA in East Bay. Bill Mater, KATE in New Mexico. John Kitchens, NS6X in Santa Barbara. David Thomas, KM4NYI in Tennessee. And Raymond LaJoy, AA1SE in Western Massachusetts. Meanwhile, ARRL New England and Roanoke divisions will have new directors January 1st. The results of these three-way contested elections for director were announced November 19th after ballots were tallied at headquarters. In the New England division, incumbent Fred Hopengarten, K1VR, received 1,054 votes. Past director Tom Frenai, K1KI, received 1,026 votes. And Tauger Fred Kemmerer, AB1OC, received 1,147 votes. Mr. Kemmerer was declared the winner. In the Roanoke Division, incumbent George W. Bud Hipsley, W2RU, received 809 votes. Past Director Jim Boner, N2ZZ, received 1,612 votes. And Challenger Marvin Hoffman, WA4NC, received 1,294 votes. Dr. Boner was declared the winner. All newly elected officials take place at noon on January 1st, 2022. Registration is open for the 2022 ARRL National Convention in Orlando. The ARRL and the Orlando Amateur Radio Club will host the 2022 ARRL National Convention and Orlando Hamcation on February 10th through the 13th, 2022 in Orlando, Florida. The convention theme, Rediscover Radio, highlights radio amateurs' commitment to developing knowledge and skills in radio technology and radio communication. Convention co-organizer and ARRL Director of Public Relations and Innovation, Bob Inderbitson, NQ1R, promises the ARRL National Convention at Orlando Hamcation will be one of the best in-person conventions ARRL has ever assembled. There will be expert presenters, community building opportunities, and plenty of social time to, to celebrate being together with our friends from across the ham radio community, Interbitson said. And who doesn't love Florida in February? The convention will kick off on Thursday, February 10th, 2022, with all-day workshops and a luncheon feature ARRL CEO Dave Minster, NA2AA, as the keynote speaker. The workshops will include Technology Academy, Emergency Communications Academy, Contest University, Winlink, and Hands-On Handbook, a step-by-step -step walk through the topics of the ARRL Handbook. These training tracks and National Convention Luncheon will take place at the Doubletree by Hilton Hotel Orlando at SeaWorld. Early registration has begun this week, and the early bird rate of $75 in U.S. currency is effective through December 15th. Hamcation, which is one of the biggest amateur radio conventions in the U.S., continues on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's February 11th, 12th, and 13th. It's taking place at the Central Florida Fairgrounds and Expo Park in Orlando. This year marks the 75th anniversary of Hamcation. Additional details on workshops and other activities can be found at hamcation.com. A report on the Alpha Defense website suggests that India may be building its own shortwave over-the-horizon radar.
In a big development, the premier radar development lab of the Indian Defence Research and Development Organisation is working on an over-the-horizon radar system to keep a close eye on Chinese movement in the Indian Ocean region. The Indo-Pacific is now turning out to be the most important part of the world today. For India, this part of the world is even more important as it's firmly in India's backyard. The specialist lab within the organization, called the Electronics and Radar Development Establishment, works in the area of design and development of ground-based, ship-borne and airborne complex radar systems and related technologies. Currently, it's also developing technologies for space-based radars. But it's also working on an over-the-horizon radar prototype. The lab is responsible for development of cutting-edge radar technology and is working with its partners to realize an over-the-horizon radar prototype in the coming six months. The system design is already complete and it's now entering prototype realization stage. The prototype radar will have two different types of antenna arrays. It will use a wire log periodic antenna array and a broadband monopole array. It's believed that the log periodic antenna array will be used to identify the best frequency to use. You can read more on this story at alphadefense.in. Just search for the Over the Horizon Radar story. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 President Don Beatty, G3BJ, a former president of the Radio Society of Great Britain, has another title to add to his name now. Recipient of the Michael J. Owen VK3KI Award, recognizing volunteer contributions that the IARU called reflective of the spirit of Michael Owen's four decades of service. The International Amateur Radio Union also chose two recipients for its Diamond Award, another honor reflecting unwavering service. They are Gobel Madhaven VU2GMNMOGDB and Ken Yamamoto JA1. CJP. Gopal was selected based on his service on Region 3's Executive Committee, which he has chaired at times. Likewise, Ken has served as its secretary and its chairman. Michael Owen, who had served as president of the Wireless Institute of Australia, had also been a director and the chairman of AIRU Region 3 and held numerous other roles over the years, contributing to the World Administrative Radio Conference in 1970 and the World Radio Communication Conference in 2003. He became a silent key in September 2012. Grants from Amateur Radio Digital Communications will benefit Amateur Radio Emergency Communication Networks in Haiti and the U.S. Virgin Islands. With more on the Haitian part of this story, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting from the Southgate Amateur Radio News in the U.K. An amateur radio digital communications grant will enable the Haiti International Friendship Club to set up HF stations to provide emergency communications to remote areas cut off by the 2021 earthquake. The magnitude 7.2 earthquake that struck Haiti on August the 14th, 2021, has shown that there is an urgent need for better emergency communications in the nation. The earthquake completely cut off communications to some areas of the country, and emergency responders were unable to get any information on the extent of the damages and what supplies and equipment were needed. This lack of communications capability hindered the ability of responders to deal with the humanitarian crisis. In order to help deal with this disaster and future disasters, the Haiti International Friendship Amateur Radio Club, in coordination with the Radio Club Deity, plans to set up a shortwave emergency communications network. Haitian amateurs have identified six sites where stations could be located, and the Haiti Club plans to provide this equipment and the personnel to set up the stations. To fund this project, Amateur Radio Digital Communications awarded HIFARC with $14,864. These funds will allow them to outfit each of the six stations with a small generator, an HF transceiver, a power supply and a wire antenna. The grant includes shipping costs from the USA to the six destinations in Haiti. The Haiti International Friendship Amateur Radio Club is a charitable organization whose mission is to foster international friendship and support amateur radio in Haiti. The organization includes members from 18 different countries who promote the amateur radio ideal of international goodwill.
working closely with Radio Club Deity, the National Society, they will help to train new hams and to bolster the emergency communications network on the island. You can learn more about them on Facebook. Just look for H-I-F-A-R-C. And Amateur Radio Digital Communications is a California-based foundation with roots in amateur radio and the technology of internet communications. ARDC makes grants to projects and organizations that follow amateur radio's practice and tradition of technical experimentation in both amateur radio and digital communications science. You can learn more about ARDC by visiting www.amper.org. That's www.ampr.org. The St. Croix Amateur Radio Club in the U.S. Virgin Islands will use its ARDC grant to augment the territory's repeater infrastructure, enabling the purchase of backup repeaters, improving repeater coverage, and training and equipping new hams. When two Category 5 hurricanes, Irma and Maria, hit the U.S. Virgin Islands in 2017, hams gathered to help. The two monster storms left the power grid and communication infrastructure in shambles, with 95% of St. Croix's electric utility poles and antenna structures dismantled. The Virgin Island government's primary land mobile radio trunked radio system was essentially non-functional, and the Army National Guard couldn't be heard on any radio frequency for a week following the storms. Territory amateur radio clubs went into action, employing skills learned during hundreds of hours of training exercises. St. Croix ham operators quickly established a daily HF net to support first responders. A single surviving ham repeater provided limited communications between islands. These links provided critical information and communications for governmental and non-governmental agencies, as well as local emergency managers and law enforcement. The $27,955 ARDC grant will enable U.S. Virgin Island hams to bolster the amateur radio infrastructure and train new operators to improve ham radio's ability to respond to future disasters. The funds will allow the Virgin Islands Amateur Radio Group, a group formed after the 2017 hurricanes, to purchase backup repeaters, more resilient antennas that will also expand coverage and training materials. ARRL U.S. Virgin Islands Section Manager and Virgin Islands Amateur Radio Group President Fred Keebler, K9VV, NP2X, commented, the generous ARDC grant will allow the group to improve and harden the territory's critical amateur repeater system, and adding digital communications capabilities marks a new chapter for new and future territory amateurs. ARDC funds projects and organizations that follow amateur radio's practice and tradition of technical experimentation in both amateur radio and digital communication science and technology. Escalating COVID conditions has once again canceled amateur radio exams in Belgium. As dramatically rising coronavirus cases in Belgium spurred authorities to fortify public health restrictions, that country's regulator, the Belgian Institute of Postal and Telecommunications Services, has announced that all amateur radio exams are being canceled until the new year. The news was posted on the website of the UBA, the membership organization known as the Royal Union of Belgian Radio Amateurs. Amateurs in Belgium do not have the option of taking exams online, and the BIPT declared that sufficient air circulation in the examination rooms cannot be assured, so tests have to be given safely. This is a second cancellation of exams since the start of the pandemic. The regulator made a similar announcement in October of 2020, citing the same concerns for candidates and examiners. Exams did not resume until this past spring. Produced by amateurs for amateurs and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Norway is planning to introduce a 10-watt entry-level license that will enable young people 12 to 13 years old to get started building simple transmitters and receivers. The Norwegian Research Council has given 1 million kroner, or approximately $116,000, to support the project to recruit young radio hams. 
A translation of the post by Sweden's SSA reads thusly, Within the framework of its program, Strength of Children and Young People's Digital Competence and Understanding of Digital Technology, the Norwegian Research Council has allocated one million kroner to the Project Radio Communications Technology for Young People. The project is carried out by the NRRL and the Research Institute of Forsvaret, and the project manager is Taborn Scali, LA4ZCA. The project aims to increase interest in technology and science in schools. The idea is to introduce amateur radio as a kind of freely chosen work in the high school. The project also includes developing an entry-level certificate that allows 12 and 13 year olds to get started with amateur radio. Norway's communications regulator, NKOM, has received clear directives and work is now being done to design certificate requirements and conditions. The project has a clear focus on the makerspace phenomena and would like to encourage young people to start by building simple transmitters and receivers. Therefore, you want a low power limit of a maximum of 10 watts to avoid interference from home-built appliances. Jaborn, who is the professor at FFI, has previous experience from voluntary code workshops in the school where children are taught to program. An important challenge to programming, makerspaces, and amateur radio has to be dedicated and trained teachers who can drive the business forward once the project has ended. SSA looks forward to interesting cooperation with NRRL in this area. DARC describes how a case of interference in the primary amateur radio 40-meter band by an AM broadcast station in Tashkent was speedily dealt with. A translation of the DARC post reads, There was an AM broadcast on 7160 kilohertz on October 22nd between 1800 and 1815 UTC. Due to the transmission power of the radio station and the breadth of the commercial A3E signal, there was considerable impairment of the radio traffic in the 7155 to 7165 kilohertz range in large parts of Europe and the Middle East. The frequency range 7000 to 7200 kilohertz is exclusively assigned to the amateur radio service in accordance with the ordinance on the Amateur Radio Act Annex 1 to Section 1, Number 6, under German regulations. Germany's Bandwatch contacted the company responsible, Media Broadcast, to investigate the cause. Media Broadcast said the mistake was made by a contracted relay station in Tashkent. The exact cause is still being investigated. The provider there had actually been commissioned by Media Broadcast to broadcast on 6,040 kilohertz in the 49-meter radio band. We were assured that this was a one-off incident and apologized for the inconvenience. This story was filed by Daniel Moeller, DL3RTL, head of the band watch. Meanwhile, the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System reports in its recent issue of the IARUMS newsletter that the Russian-Ukrainian radio war on and around 7055 kilohertz continues to be a major source of frustration. IARUMS Region 1 Coordinator Peter Yost, HB9CET, said the on-the-air conflict has been bothering us to an unbearable extent for a very long time and is still continuing. Earlier this year, International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System reported that the Russian-Ukrainian radio war had escalated. During the summer, they used more frequencies than before, affecting our bands very hard, Yost recounted. It is a great annoyance and a big shame. Yost has pointed out that the IARU monitoring system has little opportunity to stop the on-the-air conflict. Only national authorities can hopefully do something against international complaints, he said. It is very important and very helpful that many other IARU member societies also observe these frequencies and make complaints to their regulators. The long-standing conflict has also affected 7050 and 7060 kilohertz. Dave Kitteridge has been writing on Facebook about Radio Caroline, now one of the longest surviving pirate stations from the 60s, and it's still transmitting today, albeit quite legally. 30 years ago, on the 19th of November 1991, a fierce storm broke the anchor chain of the Ross Revenge, the ship from which Radio Caroline was broadcasting in the North Sea.
battered and bruised, and without power, she drifted 17 miles until she ran aground on the notorious Goodwin Sands. In the early light of the morning, her crew were helicoptered off, and she was left alone to succumb to nature. Over the years, hundreds of ships and countless lives have been taken by the Goodwin Sands, and for a while it looked as if the Ross Revenge was destined to become another one. However, she's a remarkable ship, and after four days of effort by two tugs, she was recovered and taken into Dover Harbour, where she was promptly arrested and served with a detention order. It looked like the end for Radio Caroline, but the station moved to land-based studios. The Ross Revenge was restored and is now used regularly for monthly live broadcasts. So, Caroline continues, and you can read more at www.radiocaroline.co.uk. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. What's going on? I'm Rich DeMiro, your host for today, in for Leo Laporte, who is on vacation. Thank you so much, Leo, for handing over the reins. The big story this week, Amazon employees listening to what you say to Alexa. And this really shouldn't come as a surprise. I mean, did it really surprise you to think that someone in the Amazon corporation is listening to some of the commands that you say to these smart speakers in our homes? And we've all welcomed them there, right? I've got Alexa in my home. I've got Siri. I've got uh, I've got Google Assistant, and it's it's interesting and fun to have them around because the other day my kid wanted to know what some word sounded like in Spanish, and so he asked Amazon, or sorry, he asked uh, Google Assistant. And what a world we live in. I just sat there thinking to myself, when I grew up, I had the world book encyclopedia, right? Like sitting on the shelves. And you had to go to that to find these answers. And my kid in a split second had all of the knowledge of the world through Google at his fingertips or really at his voice. So he said that command. Next thing you know, he got the word. He did it for a couple more words. And I sat there just thinking how amazing that is. But on the flip side, you have to understand that this is not something that's happening in secrecy, right? Uh, number one, you can access a list of all the things that you say to Google Assistant or to Alexa. It's no secret. It's on the website in your account, little recordings of everything that you've said to them. So if you're asking to play some music or you're asking to dim the lights, or maybe you ask a more in-depth question like, you know, why you're coughing so much or whatever it is, that's in your account right? So that's number one. People are surprised. You can go in and listen to what you said. And sometimes it's pretty surprising. So I went into my account and I heard what I said to Alexa. And uh, some of the things I said were, you know, play Snoopy on my Fire TV because I was searching for some videos for my children. And it was like different variations. And the best part is in the background, you can hear my kids talking, my wife talking, and it's all there. So to me, it's it's private, but I understand that you have to make these systems better. And that's what this article out of Bloomberg kind of um, blew the lid off this week, is saying that Amazon employs thousands of people around the world in places like Boston, Costa Rica, India, and Romania, where their job every day is to listen to as much as 1,000 audio clips per shift, transcribe these audio clips, and kind of understand Okay, so the, the bottom line is they're trying to understand what you said to the personal assistant and how they responded, right? So if you say, for example, uh, play music by the weekend, and all of a sudden the assistant comes back at you and says, okay, I'll make an appointment for you this weekend, what time? That's not what you meant. You wanted it to play some music. So the little person that's listening to this will go in there and they'll kind of figure out like, okay, well, what happened here? What did this person say and what did they want to mean by that and so they'll tweak how the assistant responds and that's how we also see these assistants respond to things that are kind of in pop culture right if there's a holiday coming up or if there's some sort of blood moon happening and you ask a question about it a lot of times these programmers are going in and they're kind of putting in information for what we're what's in the current kind of world right current events and things and they're always getting smarter but it's not all happening on their own we have this idea of kind of machine learning that is just magically happening by itself right you set up uh, one of these virtual assistants you have a bunch of people talk to them and they just get smarter all by themselves so that's not necessarily the case yes they do get smarter but it's not a hundred percent on their own 
a lot of times it does take some human intervention for these things to get better at what they do. And so that's what the article is all about. And of course, people got up in arms saying, oh, how dare you listen to what I say to my personal assistant? Well, someone has to listen. And it's not like I'm an employee at Amazon and I just go to work and I just, you know, I'm, I'm working in the accounting department. I say, hey, I want to hear what some people are saying to our assistant today. And I just fire up my computer, go to a special screen on there and, you know, and just listen to a whole bunch of voice commands. No, of course, Amazon takes the proper precautions in all of this, but these people are humans. They're going to hear stuff. They're going to react to stuff. In the article, it says that, you know, a lot of stuff they hear is pretty mundane, like, you know, people asking to play Taylor Swift or people asking, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. But they also hear other stuff like uh, a person singing badly off key in the shower or a child screaming for help. And if you're a parent, you know that your kids scream in the background a lot. Anytime I go to talk to one of my voice assistants, there's like an ongoing joke because at the end of what I'm saying, my wife or my kids chime in and ask me something without fail every single time. And it kind of messes up the command that I'm giving to the voice assistant. So I always joke about that. I'm like, can you give me one minute to just get this command in? And so of course you're going to hear stuff in the background, but if there's some other stuff as well, um, possibly criminal stuff. And this is stuff we hear about all the time in the news where the police and courts want access to these recordings because yeah, they catch some things. And people say that they listen all the time. Well, they're listening all the time, but they're really waiting for that hot word. And I've probably activated yours in the background several times in the in the course of this segment. And I do apologize for that. I forget that these things are listening and they're very sensitive. But you've had this happen right at your home where you're having a conversation with someone in your house and all of a sudden your your virtual assistant springs to life on one of those smart speakers. And you say, I didn't say that phrase. I didn't say the phrase that activates them. But still, they spring into into um, action, and at that point, they're sort of recording what you're saying in an effort to come up with a response. So Bloomberg did get a screenshot from Amazon showing kind of like, what is this associated with? Do you see my name? Do you see my address? But uh, no, you don't. So what you see, what the employees see is an account number as well as the, oh, you do see the user's first name and the device's serial number. So that is interesting that you see that Rich said this to um, the virtual assistant at this time. So that is interesting. Now, remember, um, Amazon also owns Ring and it came out that Ring had employees that also were doing similar things where they were looking at video clips from doorbells to, to kind of identify stuff in them you know, people, places, things. So these things always want to get smarter. And the way that they get smarter is through humans. And that's something we kind of forget about. But yes, you can turn off the ability to have Amazon employees look at your recordings or listen to them. And if you go to amazon.com slash Alexa privacy, there is an option to turn it off. There's also the option inside there to listen to some of your recordings as well. It's kind of eye-opening if you are if you didn't realize that this thing was happening. Uh, if you realize that it was happening, it's kind of fun to sort of listen to some of the commands you've given to your smart assistant. Thanks for making time in your weekend. Very honored to be filling in today for the one and only Leo Laporte. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. The technician license is by far the most popular class of license now held in the amateur community. So many new hams started at the technician level to the extent that the novice license was eliminated as unnecessary. The amateur community accepts the technician as an acceptable mainstream license, either as a stepping stone to a higher class license or as an end in itself. But it wasn't always like this. For the first 25 years of the technician class license existence, it was an official outcast, set apart by the FCC as separate and distinct from the other amateur classes. Why were technicians considered second class? To answer this question, we must go back to 1951. On July 1st, 1951, the FCC replaced the Class A, B, and C licenses with the Advanced, General, and Conditional classes 
and created three new licenses, the Extra, Technician, and Novice. The FCC was specific about the purpose of the Technician Class license as shown in the following quote, This class was established expressly for serious-minded experimenters who need spectrum space in which to air test their equipment. It was not established as a communication service and should not be regarded as a stepping stone between the novice and the general operator classes. The technician class of amateur license has as its purpose the provision for the serious-minded amateur experimenters to explore the higher frequencies and otherwise contribute to the art. Thus, the technician was an experimenter, not a communicator. For this reason, the FCC initially allowed technicians privileges only on frequencies above 220 megacycles. The FCC did not intend for the technician to engage in casual conversations on the air. Other than allowing the technician to simultaneously hold a novice license, which at that time was valid for only one year and non-renewable, it was expected that the technician operator would stick to experimentation, not communication. Although many of the early technicians were indeed pure experimenters, many others obtained the license as a means to communicate without having to pass the 13 words per minute code test. These technician communicators became restless with the limited frequencies available above 220 megacycles, and they wanted access to the more mainstream VHF bands at 6 and 2 meters. They were joined by a small number of technician experimenters who also wished access to 50 and 144 megacycles for the purpose of studying sporadic e-skip, building equipment for these bands, or even using their license for radio control. Thus, in early 1955, a proposal was submitted to the FCC to allow technicians access to 6 and 2 meters. Knowing that the FCC regarded the license as an experimental one, these proposals avoided mentioning communication. Rather, phrases such as greater experimentation were used. The ARRL supported technician access to six, but not two meters. In announcing their decision, the ARRL stated that six meters was far less occupied than two meters and could use the influx of technicians to study the band and thus contribute to the greater understanding of the unique characteristics of 50 megacycles. The ARRL went on to say that permitting technicians on two meters would appear to make the technician license too attractive. Many amateurs also wrote the FCC on this. Some said the technician should have the full access to all frequencies above 50 megacycles, while others opposed the move, citing the FCC's original intent for this license and expressing fears that by allowing technicians to use six and two meters, they would become mere communicators. On April 12, 1955, the FCC amended Part 12, not Part 97, of the rules and regulations to give the technician class operator six, but not two meters. The fears of those opposed to technician communicators were amplified in 1958 when, at the peak of the sunspot cycle, thousands of technicians used F-layer skip on 50 megacycles to work vast amounts of DX, with some earning the Worked All States Award. Nevertheless, allowing technicians on six meters had a beneficial effect. It helped populate a band that was underutilized and it allowed a greater study of E and F layer skip. For this reason, early in 1959, another proposal was submitted to the FCC to allow technicians full access to the 144 megacycle band. This time the ARRL agreed. They stated that things had changed since 1955 and technicians on two meters would benefit not only the advancement of the radio art, but would also allow all classes of amateur licenses to share at least one voice band in common, as novices had access to the 145 through 147 megacycle segment of two meters. Despite the ARRL's support of technicians on two meters, there was opposition. Again, the argument as to the purpose of the license was brought up. Many amateurs wrote to the FCC stating that a technician was an experimenter, not a communicator, and that the license should not be used for routine exchange of communications. One ham complained that technicians were rag-chewing and not experimenting. A few amateurs not only wanted technicians kept off of 144 megacycles, but asked the FCC to incorporate their statement as to the purpose of the license into Part 12, presumably 
so that technicians caught communicating rather than experimenting could be fined or have their licenses suspended. Others, including the ARRL, did bring in valid experimental reasons to allow technicians on two meters. Once again, the FCC compromised. They restated their official position that a technician was an experimenter, not a communicator. However, they acknowledged that VHF studies could be made on two meters and that it was beneficial to have one common meeting ground for all classes of license. Thus, on August 21st, 1959, Part 12 was amended to allow technicians access to the 145 through 147 megacycle segment of 2 meters, the same subband that the novices had. And so, technicians entered the 1960s as a distinctly second-class license. They were not eligible for racy station authorizations. They could not hold many ARRL appointments. And, despite the ARRL support of full technician access to all frequencies above 50 megacycles, the FCC's official position had not changed. Although no technician was actually ever fined or suffered a license suspension for the crime of communicating, many hams felt that technicians were merely glorified CBers who were violating the spirit, if not the letter of the law. In our next installment, we will see how a new, short-lived VHF magazine and an official change in the ARRL's viewpoint helped to bring about a gradual acceptance of technicians as real amateurs. I hope to see you then. The following item was recorded a number of years ago by Mr. Random Access Thought, Bill Barron, N2FNH. We thought you would like to enjoy this Ham Radio Christmas item once again. This time around, remastered by Bill himself at the N2FNH Studios. So here now, for your enjoyment, is A Christmas Packet. A Christmas Packet, with apologies to Clement Seymour. Twas the night before Christmas, the moon shone so bright, its light on the snow was a beautiful sight. I sat down in my easy chair with a sigh, through the window I stared at the stars in the sky. Suddenly I woke to a racket. I knew right away something came in on the packet. I rose from my chair and went back to my shack, while the radio kept up its clackety-clack. A brap burst out of my TNC. The headline said that it was for me. This must be a joke, was the thought in my head. D.E. the North Pole was the way that it read. I knew that it must be one of the boys, so I tried to connect to the source of the noise. So quickly I typed, con ok on, but just as fast as it came, it was gone. Then from the parlor I heard a soft thump. And then heard the front door close with a bump. Puzzled, I went to the living room door. And there my eyes were drawn down to the floor. I couldn't believe what I saw by the tree. Earplugs for my wife and a new rig for me. That sneaky old elf, he pulled quite a gag. While I was in the back, he snuck in with his bag. The few minutes I was on, packety pack, gave him just enough time to empty his sack. Then from my set, I heard one last zap. I turned and was back in my shack in a snap. I thought I knew what this message might be, so as I sat down to look at the CRT, this line I read by the screen's tree light. Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a good night. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guthfors at 1UG, your host. One of the most well-known hams on the air until recently is Art Bell W6OBB, who for years entertained late-night radio audiences with his excellent guest interviews around the subject of the paranormal and UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Art's show on Coast to Coast AM became the highest-rated late-night show syndicated on 500 stations nationwide and attracting 15 million listeners. Like many who grew up on talk radio as a kid, I loved to listen to Art on long overnight drives around the Southwest. His ham radio story is even older than his broadcast story. Art Bell, W6OBB, is my guest on QSO Today. W6OBB, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Art? 4Z1UG, Eric, this is Art Bell, W6OBB, in Pahrump, Nevada. How are you doing? I'm great, Art. Thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. 
Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? How did you become interested in amateur radio? <laughs> um, it is a very long story. I'm now 70 years old, Eric, and I began, um, I'm going to say, I began my interest when I was about 11 or 12, and I would go to my grandma's house, and she had this old, uh, I'd had to stand five feet up, old radio, and it covered the shortwave bands, uh, not sideband, uh, which we didn't even have then, actually, but just AM shortwave, and I would listen around, I'd hear other countries, and I thought it was magic, Eric. So I became more and more interested. I finally ran into a fellow who lived down the street from me. This was in Pennsylvania at the time. And uh, he actually, believe it or not, was a nuclear scientist. However, he in his basement had a full setup and would entice me by having me come over and sit and watch him talk to Europe and around the world. And I was hooked. I mean, I was hook, line, and sinker hooked. So he slowly trained me to become a novice, and I took my test, and my first uh, rig was a Heathkit AT1 transmitter, which was crystal controlled and good for about 30 watts on a good day. And, um, and so I got on, and that's how it happened. I think I was uh, licensed either when I was 11 or 12, no, I'm going to say 12 or 13, I'm sorry, 12 or 13, either late 12 or early 13, and um, that's all I did. I would sit in my room, and I would operate day and night. I uh, didn't particularly enjoy CW, I still don't, but I, I, I know it. For some reason, CW came easily to me. It's strange, because I don't, I don't really like CW, but it came easily to me. I'm one of those people, I guess. And do you remember what your first call sign was? Oh, sure. No, who would ever forget that? KN3JOX, licensed in uh, in Pennsylvania, Media Pennsylvania. And uh, gosh, uh, that really brings back memories. So KN3JOX became K3JOX as I obtained my, my general. And then uh, finally I became, I've not that I had that many calls in my life, uh, Eric, I became W2CKS. Got very lucky when I moved uh, into the two area. And so I got a pretty good call, W2CKS. Then finally, as an adult, I wanted to live on the west coast of the U.S., so away I went. And I, I believe I sent a letter with my license, Eric, and I begged to get a W call because I had been lucky enough to get one uh, in the two call area. So I literally begged <laughs> the FCC. <laughs> and sure enough, they came back, believe it or not, and uh, gave me W6OBB. And I have had that ever since. So we're talking about from the age of 12 or 13 to 70. And uh, never not been a ham. Never not had a rig that was working and operable. Now, you're, a, you're an extra class licensee. When did you upgrade to extra class? What happened is I was a general. Uh, I then, in San Diego, California, as I mentioned, I went to the West Coast, took uh, the advanced class, and I became an advanced for a lot of years. Um, I thought it was sort of a badge of honor because an advanced class license, you know, indicates that you did pass the CW test. So... There you have it. For the I, general. Uh, yeah, well, right. Um, so I passed the advanced and uh, kept that for years. And then finally, when the commission came out with the new allocations and, you know, the extras were given so much more bandwidth on bands that I love, like 75 meters, I finally was pushed over the edge and went and took my extra and passed it. Oh, there you go. Now, you mentioned that you had the Heathkit AT1 as your first rig. Do you remember what the receiver was? Sure. The AC-3. <laughs> also a Heathkit. Yeah, that's right. And I, I can tell you a funny little story about that. Um, I, of course, needed a receiver. I got the transmitter and then needed a receiver. So I ordered that from Heathkit. And I was not what you would call a technician at that point. I, I, in other words, I didn't know a lot of technical stuff. So when I got the Heathkit, I got all the parts out like everybody does 
didn't read the instructions the way I was supposed to, Eric. And so I didn't know that I was supposed to shorten lead length. My assumption was that all capacitors and resistors had to be the length they were given to me as. So I didn't shorten any lead lengths. Now, I built the entire, <laughs> I built the entire thing, and you can well imagine uh, capacitors and uh, resistors were you know, sticking out like spaghetti uh, from the bottom. And I had built it uh, correctly with that exception. So when I finally proudly slid this thing into its case and turned on the power, it sort of caught on fire. Because as, as you can imagine, all the resistors and capacitors meshed together. And uh, it was a pretty big disaster. So uh, I finally realized my, the error of my ways. I redid the whole thing, and God bless, it worked. And what kind of antenna did you use in, as your, on your novice rig? <laughs> um, I, yeah, these really are things you never forget. It was, it was just a long wire, a 65-foot long wire. Uh huh. With a tune, end fed tuner or something like that. Uh, I had a uh, well. The Heathgate AT1 uh, lent itself to a long wire antenna. You know, there was one mm -hmm. screw there, and that was it. So. Oh, on the output, yeah. Yeah. No coax output on that. Oh that no. Radio. No, 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 no. Not that I recall. Maybe there was, but I, I don't recall it. I just recall a single wire attachment point, and uh, and I, I used a long wire in the beginning. After the first mentor that you had in Pennsylvania, did you have any other Elmers or mentors that kind of helped you along? Um, when we'd be riding down the street, and by that I mean when I would be in my mom's car and we'd be headed somewhere, I would uh, typically see an antenna and I'd go, Mom, stop, stop. And we'd stop at the antenna and I would uh, go and knock on the door you know, and I'd meet the ham, and inevitably, inevitably, whoever it was would hand me some piece of equipment that he didn't want anymore and say, God bless you, son, see you later. So I don't know about metters, but donations I did receive. <laughs> Anything, like, really spectacular that you received as a donation? Um, No, slow additions to the shack, uh little things, clocks, um, occasionally and another rig of one sort or another. I think I had a Halicrafters receiver that only changed frequency slightly when you touched the desk. And, uh, you know, I, I slowly moved up in the world. I think I went pretty much through the Heathkit line, Eric. I went from a AT1 to a, uh, a DX20, uh, a DX40, a DX60, and then finally, an Apache. So that takes you pretty quickly through my my early days. I, you know, I couldn't afford a lot, uh, so that's what I had. I, I loved the Apache. It was plate modulated, sounded like a million dollars, and you know that that sort of. I hate to rush you through all those days, but uh, I was on the air every day, mostly all day, to my mother's dismay, and. Um, enjoying myself. I have always loved seven, lower bands, 75 and 40, because, you know, you can kind of hook up with people that you met the day before or last week and pretty reliably know that you'll be talking to them again and uh, meet up with them on the band. Um, I also did, as a young ham, operate an awful lot of the, uh, the higher bands. And as I do today, I operate all bands. So, God, I had a blast when I was a kid, uh, Eric. And I, I mentioned to my mother's dismay, I think she thought I was overdoing it. I'm sure I was. But ham radio then is quite quickly what led me into broadcast radio. So we'll go there in just a minute, Art. But let me ask a question, because it sounds to me like your, your parents were quite supportive of your hobby. I mean, they might have complained that maybe you were infatuated with it. Mine did. What kind of impact did amateur radio have or and still have on your family life? I guess my ham hobby has impacted um, my family life all my life. I mean, uh, and I've, I've had a, a couple of families, Eric, so sure, it's always impacted it. There was never a time that I didn't devote one room of whatever abode I was in to amateur radio. 
and and that includes today. I'm sitting in the shack right now, so it's impacted my family life always. And uh, my mom was afraid that uh, it would lead to no good things for me. Uh, quite to the contrary, it it led to my eventual career. I found that as I at, as I entered my career in broadcasting, Eric, and I know it's rushing you a little bit to get you there already, but what I found is that I got eternal connections. In other words, there's amateur radio is kind of a brotherhood. Yes. And once you walk in a place and you're applying for a job or something like that, and the other fellow mentions that he's a ham, you can almost know it's a lock. I mean, not absolutely, but the Brotherhood has always taken care of its own, Eric, and uh, it certainly took care of me. I was only 13 years old when I finally, uh, toward the end of 13, w went and got a commercial first-class radio telephone license. So there you go. I, you know, I, I went from ham radio and never left ham radio, not one day in all these years, and then I entered uh, the broadcast realm. And I did so pretty much in engineering, but quickly moved on to on-the-air work. And I, I'm telling you, Eric, and this is truth, and I suspect it's still pretty much true today, that if you mention you're a ham, and uh, the, the guy sitting across the desk from you is a ham, you have probably got a lock on the job. So ham radio has served me all my life. I, it's It's not just a hobby it's an absolute love yeah boy i got that here you are a 13 year old with a first class radio telephone license well what happened there you know you've, <laughs> you you've got ham radio um it's opening doors for you did it influence um it obviously influenced career but did it also influence education um yes i i i think it's fair to say yes uh although uh i have a limited formal education some college I don't think it propelled me, in, you know, toward a further educational goal of some sort. I wanted to get in radio, Eric, and I and by radio I mean commercial broadcasting. And so I would go to the local radio station, whatever that was. We moved around a lot as I was uh, a child, Eric. My mom and dad were both Marines. My mother was a uh, one of the first women Marines in the country, and. Uh, uh, she was a drill instructor, if you can believe that, at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. My dad is a retired colonel, was a retired colonel from the uh, Marine Corps, and I was born on Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. So you can imagine I had fairly strict parents. At any rate, I began going to hang out as much as they would let me at local radio stations, meeting the disc jockeys, meeting the engineers going ooh and ah at uh, the three five hundred uh, or three four hundred I guess it was transmitters and you know digging into stuff and, and just doing everything I could at a radio station whether it was engineering or it was air work or bringing somebody their coffee what have you I, I did that endlessly as a child and uh, every day literally every day Eric I was either on ham radio or at some radio station trying to figure out what I could learn and glean and whether I could get a job. Well, we've had a number of guests on the QSO Today podcast who were engineers at radio stations as kids because, you know, the, the kids with the first class license walks in the door and he's, you know, he's got the job. But not many of them, you know, end up on the air except maybe because there's a spot in the middle of the night to fill and uh, the, the station manager says, well, why don't you fill it, read the news or something like that. <laughs> How did you end up on the air? Well, I'm laughing because uh, that ultimately is exactly how I ended up with my big career in radio. You know, somebody who said, well, I guess we're going to have to put you on at night. But that's a story for downline, I guess, a little bit. I, I started, as I mentioned, to finally get jobs. You know, I guess I had a decent voice and I landed a job at a station in little FM religious station in Franklin, New Jersey. And to get to work, I had to climb this mountain. I mean, it was literally on the mountain. 
instead of just putting the antenna on the mountain, the whole thing was there. It was a religious FM station, Eric, and all I did was read the news every hour. But I stayed there full time to do it. And uh, the man who owned and ran the station was of an unusual sort. Uh, he had a thing about people who get too close to the microphone. He liked my news, but he thought I got too close to the mic. And uh, so in the middle of a five-minute newscast, he would walk into the studio, grab the back of the chair, and yank it out from under me. And, and right on the air, you would hear me take a tumble onto the floor, and he'd start ranting at me. And needless to say, I, I didn't stay for a long time at that FM station. But that's kind of start I had, rough start, I guess I had. And then from that point, Eric, I, I was looking toward, you know, I'm a kid, so I'm looking toward rock and roll radio. And I did secure some jobs at some rock stations. Uh, I'm talking about top 40 here. And um, it did pretty well, actually did pretty well. And then I finally said, ah, the heck with this. I'm going to go in the Air Force. So I... I took a break from everything, went into the Air Force, all set for a radio career. And uh, they said, no, uh, it looks like you're going to go into, brace yourself, Eric, medicine. So I became a, a medic. I went to Amarillo Air Force Base after basic training in San Antonio and uh, was a medic and then made my way to the Far East. Inevitably, you can guess the years touchdown in uh, Okinawa, spent a lot of time in Okinawa, Eric, uh, on Okinawa, and uh, of course Vietnam, uh, the Philippines, and spent a lot of time in the Far East. Now, when I left the Air Force, I did four years and out, uh, Eric, when I left the Air Force, I had fallen in love with the island of Okinawa. And so I wrote a letter. There was a commercial broadcast station at that time. We administered the island of the Ryukyu Islands were administered by the U.S. Eric. And so there was a commercial broadcast station owned by an Okinawan company, Ryukyu Hoso, actually. I wrote them a letter. They had a rock and roll station that served the GIs on the island. At that time, that was about a quarter of a million if you included the dependents. And... I got an answer, and they said, come on to Okinawa. We're going to pay your way, and you can, you can do air work. And so I spent a total of 10 years, Eric, on the island of Okinawa. Wow. Yeah. You're a handy guy. So were you also the um, station engineer as well as the uh, on-air talent? No, no, no. That was all Okinawans. But it was quite an experience. I fell in love with the Far East, Eric. I remember... We had an old teletype machine in a little soundproof room. And the only way that one could get news would be to pick it up by radio. I think there were two or three different frequencies, but it came from the U.S. by radio. And so if you can imagine, uh, you know, the selective fading that was coming from California, which is where the signal was coming from all the way to Oklahoma, <laughs> typically halfway through a story, uh, it would go into a selective fade, and you would have complete garble. So you couldn't just run into this little room and rip. You had to read as well. If you didn't read, you'd get halfway through a story, and it'd go in total garble. So that's how we got our news from the Associated Press halfway across the world. Do you remember the station call letters? Sure. KSBK. KSBK. Yes, Kilowatt Sugar Bravo Kilowatt about that. And I was a ham there, of course. I was a ham everywhere. I was KR6BK. What did you schlep along with you as, as far as ham radio gear when you were in Okinawa? It wasn't so much a matter of schlepping. Uh, for example, to Okinawa, I took very nearly nothing to Okinawa and bought the rig that I wanted, which at that time I believe was a Tempo. Bought it and lived in a little Japanese house with, at that time, a cute little Japanese girl and had, uh, I constructed my antenna on the roof from bamboo. And my brilliant idea, Eric, was to take long sections of bamboo uh, and cover them with aluminum foil. 
which is not bad. Actually, Eric worked very well. And uh, you can create uh, uh, dipoles from that. You can create uh, beams from that. You can do a whole lot, Eric, with bamboo and aluminum foil. And so that's the way I operated for any number of years as KR6BK on the island of Okinawa. And uh, those were pretty good condition times. Uh, you could typically work any day you wanted into California, no problem at all. So what brought you, what brought you back to the United States? Um, my radio career. Now, if you want to get anywhere in radio, probably Okinawa as a launching point career-wise is not the ideal place. So if you ever really want to get anywhere, you've got to come back to the continental United States and begin, uh, be begin getting on bigger and bigger and bigger radio stations. And that's exactly what I did. I slowly climbed the ladder of rock and roll in those days and uh, enjoyed it very much. Now, I was up and down the dial, like WKRP, for example. I was in so many states and I kept moving to a slightly bigger, slightly bigger, slightly bigger radio station and spent about a total of, oh, I would guess 20 years, Eric, doing rock and roll. Uh, that first class radio telephone license served me well and got me in a lot of doors that would not have opened otherwise. I did quite a bit of actual engineering, considered myself to be a pretty decent audio engineer and um, was hired by some stations to just work on their audio chains and would travel and do that. Now, what I really loved was being on the air, Eric, and um, so I, I did pretty well. I went uh, not all the way as far as one might go in the rock and roll world, but uh, I was uh, almost, almost got a job in New York City actually auditioned for WABC in New York. Didn't make it, but auditioned. Worked for Extra uh, down in Tijuana. Uh, worked for New Haven, WAVZ, which in those, in that, at that particular time was a pretty decent job, to be honest with you. And um, so up and down the dial and uh, did about 20 years total of rock and roll. And then one day, Eric, Somebody asked me if I thought I could do talk, if I, if I thought I could do a talk show. Uh, this was up in Anchorage, Alaska at K-E-N-I. Pretty good sized station in Anchorage, actually, Eric. And uh, so I did a talk show and it was immensely successful. And uh, then I came back to the lower part of the U.S. Again, this is really where the action is. Worked in the uh, Monterey area doing talk. Yeah, well, what did you talk about? Because it's my, it's my understanding that you actually changed gears on talk. Oh, I did. I began in talk radio the way everybody in those days began, and that was uh, with political talk radio. And uh, so I talked politics. I I don't care. I got interested in it. It was fun. You could have on the air fights. <laughs> you know, it was pretty wild. So that's what I did. And then, then I took a break. After all these years in radio, uh, I was married at the time. It was no life because you had to keep moving from town to town. And again, up and down the dial, right? No sort of life to uh, uh, continue with. So I said, okay, that's it. I'm getting out of radio. I went to work uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada for a cable company, and um, I became their chief technician. I built their what's called their head end. That's where all the video processors are. Uh, it's where all the satellite antennas are. It's where the, uh, the microwave shots are, cars band microwave. Pretty big facility, actually, uh, Eric. And I worked my way up. I became became the chief technician after I built everything, and I took care of it for a number of years. When I was building that facility, Eric, I loved it. I mean, it was all technical stuff. I was off to school at Hughes uh, AML Microwave and learning all sorts of new things and doing all sorts of new things, and every day was a new adventure. Unfortunately, after I built it and I had a large crew of people working for me, I began to get bored, Eric. 
sitting around waiting for something to break. Very well paid, uh, frankly. But um, I don't know. It started to get boring. So one day, I got a call from a friend of mine whose name is, was Jack Daniels. I think he may still be around. And he was working at KDWN in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, it's a, it was, and I believe still is, a talk station. Now, it's a 50,000-watt blowtorch on 720 in Las Vegas. And he said, God, come on, you, I, I know I heard you did talk. Come on over. You don't have to take the job. Just do a talk show uh, every morning during the week with me, and let's see how you like it. Well, you know, it was like a hook with a worm on it, and I, I bit really hard. I did do that talk show for about six months, Eric, during the day. And, of course, 50,000 watts is good. But from Las Vegas, after it covers Las Vegas, it goes out to the desert and stops, right? You know, it, you can only go so far in the desert, even with 50,000 watts. So after about six months, I knew this is what I wanted, Eric. And um, I went to my wife at the time, and I told her that I was going to give up this really well-paying job. And... I was going to go and be on the radio. Well, she, that kind of did in my marriage, Eric. She, she thought I was absolutely out of my mind. I mean, I had a high paying job, every benefit you could imagine, lots of security. I had built the, the cable company and I went to them and told them I was going to walk away, uh, begin working, well, not for peanuts, but peanuts. For less. Uh, not, <laughs> not, it would be peanuts plus not much. Um, and she, she thought I was crazy. And ultimately, you know, that cost me the marriage. But I went to work for KWN. And every minute I was there, Eric, I had my eye. You mentioned the nighttime. I had my eye on the nighttime. Because while 50,000 watts goes out and covers, you know, Las Vegas, which is great. Uh, after that, it's just cactus. But, aha, at night. Even though slightly directional, KDWN covered 13 states at night. 13 states. So I began, that would be regarded as a clear channel station, right? Uh, as close as you can get. There really aren't any exact clear channels left. But yes, uh -huh, that's right. And um, every night at sunset, we would have to... Uh, throw a couple of switches, and go directional. I think we were protect, protecting uh, WGN in Chicago. Uh, by the way, Eric, I, I can't tell you how many nights I came within. I actually had my finger on the button. I, I, I worked at KWN, Eric, for a total of 10 years. I worked uh, late nights. I came to work at about 10 o'clock at night. Um, I would go on the air uh, at one o'clock in the morning, and I'd frequently be on the air until six o'clock in the morning doing talk radio. And again, in the beginning, it was absolutely uh, political. So I did that for a long time and really, really, really enjoyed myself and did very well uh, in the ratings. But I, just for the hams out there, I thought I'd tell you, Eric, there were about 10 or 15 times that I actually went over to the console, put my finger on the switch that would turn us non-directional because I wanted to see if I could get calls from other parts of the country. <laughs> 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 you know, I came within just that much of turning that baby non-directional. I can't tell you how many times, but, you know, I was in mortal fear of the Federal Communications Commission, and I'm, I was sure they would come marching in and chop my head off within minutes. So I never did do it. I'm kind of still sorry I didn't, frankly. So what happened, Eric, is here I am pretty successful doing this nighttime show, uh, being heard across the 13 states as advertised, getting a lot of calls. And one day I got bored with politics. I said, ah, not another night, not another five hours of politics. Oh, no. So I had a friend, 
you may have heard the name or know the name Lear, as in Learjet. Well, John Lear is the son of the man who put together and owned Learjet, John Lear. And John has some unusual ideas about virtually everything, including UFOs, including Area 51 that I'm very close to uh, as I speak to you right now, and the things that have gone on out there. So I thought, you know, I wonder what will happen. Now, now bear in mind, the owners of KWN were conservatives. They ran that as a conservative radio station. Anything else was heresy. So I thought, well, just one night. Let me give it a try. And I, I had John Lear on. I thought, how interesting would it be to talk about Area 51, to talk about UFOs, to talk about all sorts of different things. So I had him on, and that was the beginning of the end, Eric. I began getting so many calls that, uh, well, we had an 800 line. Back, that was back in the days when you had to have an 800 line. If you wanted out-of-state calls, that's how you got them. And I kept doing these kinds of topics, and about a month into it, Eric, of course, my boss was going totally berserk, uh, not wanting me to do this, ordering me not to do this, threatening to fire me. And by the way, they did fire me, I think, three and perhaps four times. Problem was, Eric, the ratings were so good. I mean, during the day, the radio station had virtually no ratings. At night, when I was on, we were number one. Everybody loved it. Well, everybody except the owners. They hated it. Absolutely hated it. I mean, you can imagine uh, some very staunch conservatives uh, trying to answer to their friends how their radio station was talking about UFOs and things of that sort at night. It drove them crazy. About what year was this? Uh, this would have been probably the mid to, let's see. By the time we were talking about this sort of thing, it would have been the mid-90s. Mid-90s. Uh, so I, I, was, I was taken in there and fired at least four times, Eric, and uh, then almost immediately rehired. I remember one day that uh, somebody came to me and said, uh, Art, we love your show. The the Concord, the supersonic uh, Concord, is going to be in Las Vegas and then making a trip to Paris, France. And guess what? We're going to get you and the lady friend of your choice on to the Concord uh, and go to Paris. And so I went to the lady who owns the show, uh, the station rather, and I said, look, I've got this chance to go to Paris for free on the Concorde, supersonic, one of the last flights actually, Eric, and I'm going to go. It means I'm going to miss a night, maybe two nights of radio. And she said, no. I said, okay, then I quit. She said, you're fired. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I, I left. I went to Paris, I had a ball, I came back home and got immediately rehired. And okay, so I spent a total of uh, 10 years at that radio station, two or three of them talking about UFOs and the paranormal and weird stuff, Eric. And it was so much fun, it was so different. And from that, I began to get uh, syndicated. You know, I began to suddenly show up in Phoenix. Um, I had a fellow who syndicated me. So I, then I was in LA, then I was uh, in Seattle, then I was in Portland. Then I began going east. And before you know it, I think I was on about 530 radio stations, something like that. So radio has treated me very, very well, Eric. I would, I would say to anybody out there, a ham, anybody interested in radio, if this is what you're going to do, then uh, th then good luck. I, you know, you mentioned the, the late night thing. Um, I actually felt guilty after a while, Eric, because, you know, the fact that I was so successful um, at that time working for Premier Radio Network's Clear Channel uh, Corporation, that if I'm on 530 radio stations, I am taking jobs away 
from 530 people, and they're probably starter-type jobs. And so I actually felt guilty about that. But Right in the middle of the night. I, I think that's where I actually first heard you was um, I used to fly into cable systems that I operated in the Midwest in the 90s and um, would have to drive from like the St. Louis airport, you know, out into uh, Indiana or or uh, Illinois. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you, and there, were, there you were there you know, I, on the radio in the middle of the night. Yeah, there I was indeed. And um, so I guess people can look me up on QRZ, but I'm still at this time a very, very active ham. Uh, Eric, I guess I should add that I, I had yet another pretty good DX experience. I'm married to a Filipina lady, beautiful Filipina lady, and I ended up uh, after the wife I was married to uh, some years ago in 2006 uh, passed away. Very sad. Um, I met this Filipina lady, and I decided, ah, oh, what the heck, I'm going to the Philippines. So. Met her after talking with her for a long time and decided, well, you know what? Why don't I live in the Philippines for a while? That should be fun. Uh, this is as I'm, let's see, 65 years old. No, 62 years old. And so I spent, I guess I've spent a total of three or four years in the Philippines, uh, Eric. And again, uh, ham radio was with me. I had uh, all kinds of good radios in the Philippines, got them over there by hook or crook, and more times than not, it's crook because uh, it's not easy getting them in over there. The Philippines is still sort of operated by a bit of graft here and there, so you have to grease a palm uh, to get in what you want to get in, which is what I did. I had a condo, Eric. Uh, in fact, I still own that condo up on the 19th floor, 19 of 20 floors, in Manila. I actually, I guess I should hang my head when I say this, uh, in order to get on the air, I snuck up to the roof of our condominium, very modern, very nice, sort of unreeled a rope until my wife could get her hands on it, tied a coax onto the rope and uh, had her yank, you know, pull it on down into the window if you can imagine on this modern condo, here's the uh, here's the coax going up to the roof, and I snuck an antenna up there. I was at the very, very peak of the roof. They had no idea it was there, Eric, uh, just a dipole to begin with. And uh, finally, they, they about had cats and dogs when they saw it. They got hold of their lawyer, made me take it down. Uh, about a year later, I did manage to get a real antenna up there, a 2-meter 440, which was great, and a multiband uh, dipole. Ultimately, however, even though I caused not one moment of angst nor problem for of any sort, I was ordered to take it down by the board of directors and uh, their attorney, and so I had to take it down. And that's really why I came back to the U.S. But while I was over there, I took the test. Uh, Eric, and became 4F1AB, 4 Foxtrot 1 Alpha Bravo. Uh, and you can only do that when you originally get to the Philippines. I, I, they dubbed me DU1 slash W6OBB. And I got so sick of saying that, that I studied for the Philippine test, the highest class test they've got, and passed it. And that's how I became 4F1AB. A lot easier to say than DU1 slant W6OBB. And I operated from there until, as I mentioned, the lawyer made me take the antennas down. And this will give you a sense of how much I love ham radio. When they told me I had to take my antennas down, Eric, I said, okay then, goodbye. <laughs> I would have stayed in the Philippines to this very day, Eric, uh, if they had uh, allowed me my antennas. I had delivered unto them, and it was my fault. You know, I had the multiband antenna and the 2-meter 440 antenna, and all was well. And then I thought, well, okay, if I got that, then why don't I get an engineer? They love local engineers. So I got a local engineer who designed a tower and a tri-band antenna beam. Uh, along with a dipole. And all of this 
well designed, paid for, submitted it to the board of directors. Board of directors said, oh, we didn't know you had an antenna up there. Not only can you not have this, but you've got to take down what you've got up. And I was devastated. And so that's how my wife and I decided to come back to the U.S. Were you involved with the ham radio community there? And what did you think? Uh, I was. I think that they're uh, quite a nice bunch, actually. And uh, they've got unusual operating habits uh, as compared to the U.S. I I'll tell you a funny story. When I first got my antenna up, uh, Eric, I would listen every day during the day, during the morning and afternoon to 2015 and 10 meters, hoping upon hope for an opening of some kind. This is before we had the recent uh, uptick in conditions. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't hear a thing. The bands were shut down tight as a drum. And so one night I went in there, had to be about, I think it was seven, eight o'clock at night, something like that. The sun at that latitude reliably goes down at six o'clock. Anyway, suddenly 2015 and a few signals were there on 10 meters at eight o'clock at night. And I went, what? Well, it turns out, Eric, that down at that latitude, that part of the world, those bands strangely open up at night. And so I had been checking day in and day out, not hearing a thing, and suddenly I discovered they were open at night, and away I went. Amazing. It is. Could, could we go back to broadcast radio for just a second? Sure. Can. Or, sure. Um, broadcast radio and talk radio, it seems, has kind of morphed over time. Can you speak about the changes that you see in the industry and where live talk is headed? <laughs> I think think that live talk, Eric, is going to be fine. Where it's headed, you know, that's a harder question. Uh, I think that uh, here in the U.S., AM radio is on its way out, Eric. I think it's on the way out. Uh, I think it's going to be replaced by the digital modes. And uh, th that process is well underway. Now, talk, it's just talk. It will always be around. It's a matter of how it's delivered. So I think that a lot of what's on AM now is going to shift to FM in the U.S. I, I can't speak for, you know, the worldwide situation but here in the U.S. It's going to go to FM, and there it will be for a period of time. And then finally, I think uh, everything's going to move to the digital modes. I mean, here we, we all carry around these phones that at this point in my career, I consider all those phones kind of like, you know, little portable radios of old. How frequently now does one go down the street and see somebody holding a portable radio up to their ear the way you did when, uh, well, when I was young anyway, Eric? That was a frequent sight. Now it's uh, the phone they're holding or little, you know, earbuds plugged in listening as they stroll down the street. So the world is changing and these little phones are the new portable radios. What do you think of podcasting and its ability to attract like a worldwide audience? Well, Podcasting is still not caught up to radio, but it's catching up quickly. And, um, of course, my most recent effort, something called Midnight in the Desert, was done as a, I won't say as a podcast, uh, Eric, because I did it live. But then, of course, we would uh, allow people for a small fee to purchase copies of the show later. And so what do I think of it? I love it. You can do high-quality work. You can do it live. You can do it uh, uh, and make money, I think that it's got a, a wonderful future. What, what's next for Art Bell professionally? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I never know, Eric, professionally. Uh, I may go back and uh, do, I think, I think I'm probably going to end up doing a weekly show instead of trying to do it five nights a week, which uh, that's a lot, uh, Eric, uh, at my age, that's a lot. So, I may end up uh, doing one or two shows a week, something like that. Just, you know, kind of keep my hand in. Well, if you were doing a podcast, Art, it wouldn't be hard for you to attract an audience. I think, you know, at your peak, you had 15 million listeners oh, yeah. you know, on a night when you were on 530 syndicated stations. So, uh, Correct. yeah, I look forward to your podcast. I was a time traveler, and uh, a time traveler is someone who um, pays – for the podcast version, which is what I liked uh, when I, when you were on up until no December, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a problem here. Uh, we had somebody who 
either did not want me on the air or has a personal grudge and uh, took a shot at me. Um, that that was kind of discouraging. I, I don't like getting shot at. I had that experience uh, when I was young, and that was enough for me. So somebody took a pot shot at me. I, I don't. I, I had several bad experiences, and so I stopped doing the, uh, we'll call it a podcast for the sake of conversation. But I'm going to go back and I'm going to do a show or two a week, Eric. I'm, you know, born into radio, and I'm sure until my last day I'll be doing it. On your QRZ page, you show an elaborate farm of wire antennas in your desert location. Oh, yes. What antennas do you have on your property? <laughs> um, well, I've got a 100-foot radio tower, single tower. And on that tower, I've got a, a KLM log periodic. I've got a six meter uh, beam. I've got a two meter 440 1200 antenna at the very top. And then I use that 100 foot tower as the main support uh, for my very, very large antenna. I think I may have the largest private loop antenna, actually double loop, made of number 10 wire, that completely encircles a five-acre piece of land. And it's a, uh, it's a, what can I say, it's kick-butt antenna. There's, I believe that its actual resonant point, believe it or not, is 640 down in the AM dial. And again, it's made of number 10 wire. It's a double loop. Uh, separated, the wires are separated by about seven feet. It was inspired by W6AM. I don't know if you know that, that call sign. Sure, oh, I do. Sure, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, read his book, and that inspired my antenna. The antenna is held up by a total of 13 towers. And uh, those towers are about 76 feet tall apiece. Again, each one supporting this double loop. And it's an amazing antenna, Eric. I don't know what to tell you. It's simply amazing. It'll make 100 watts sound like several thousand. It's that effective. And, and I put it up mainly for 160, 80, and 40. I really, really love 160 meters. I love 75 meters. And I spent a great deal of, seven, on, of time on 75. And I, I want to talk briefly, if I can, Eric, about my lost love. And when I say lost love, that's 75 meters. Uh, there are some pretty uh, bad actors on 75 meters uh, here in the U.S., Eric, uh, bo both, I believe, on the East Coast and the West Coast. We suffer a particular uh, dysfunction here on the West Coast of people who seem more like they want to harm ham radio than they do, as they claim, help it. They use bad language, they have bad manners, they are not what I would call part of the fraternity of amateur radio. Now, the commission has made some recent moves to try and clean some of this up, but frankly, it has not yet been cleaned, and as a result, I built this, God, I don't know how much I spent on that antenna, Eric, I bet I, bet I spent $20,000 total on that antenna. And it was to have fun on 75 meters. But fun for me does not include bad language. It does not include jamming. It does not include the bad behavior that you can see exhibited up and down the 75 meter and to some degree the 40 meter band, to some degree even the 20 meter band. Uh, so I'm not sure what's, what's happened to amateur radio, to hams that once were well behaved and part of a fraternity. I don't know what's going on, Eric. Well, I seem to remember in the 70s when I got started, even when I was a novice, I used to listen to 80 meters at night in California. And um, I think there was even that stuff going on then. There was. There was. But to a far lesser degree, we have become somewhat of a less civil society in the U.S. And and I guess it's a reflection of the, you know, the less less civil society. That's all I can say. Uh, but I hope the uh, commission cleans it up and uh, they're making noises as though they may do so. One wonders though, because it seems as though the FCC here in the U.S. is doing less enforcing, closing offices, and not doing, well, frankly, what people like myself hope they would do. Well, you would think considering what the FCC charges for channels, 
you know, when they sell Spectrum at auction, <laughs> that they would, um, you know, put some of that money back into into their enforcement yeah. division. Yes, well, uh, they don't. I, you know, there there was a day when you had to, you actually got charged if you wanted a ham license. Uh, when you applied for a license, you had to pay a certain fee. They eliminated that fee. And I always thought that, well, maybe that had something to do with the fact that no money was going into enforcement. I don't know, but I would gladly pay whatever to see that enforcement is done. And I don't know. It's just kind of discouraging. And so as a result, I don't go on the 75-meter band and very rarely now on 40. So I built all of that, and it sits up there to a large degree unused because of the kind of behavior I just talked about. Um, one hopes one day that will change. Do you see yourself going back to CW or the digital modes or anything like that? No, as I mentioned to you, um, CW was an interesting thing for me. I used it, of course, every day, every hour <laughs> that I was awake as a novice. And it was it came to me very easily, but it always struck me as a, frankly, slow way to communicate. You know, I'm a talker. What can I say? I'm a talker. So I prefer AM. I prefer sideband, uh, which, of course, I'm on now. And I prefer, uh, for example, I'm very much into high-fidelity audio. And uh, the commission and I have had go-rounds about that because when I say high-fidelity audio, I'm thinking of, of four kilohertz type audio, which can be made to sound virtually pretty close to a you know a broadcast type signal uh, if you work at it. It's it's just another aspect of the hobby, and I worry that the AWRL uh, would like to see us get more and more narrow. Uh, if they had their way, I think we'd be uh, uh, we be transmitting nothing over about a kilohertz wide. <laughs> Do you have an AM uh, broadcast transmitter on 160 or, or 80? No, re no, re -tasked no AM I, I don't. I, of course, many for many years had exactly that. Uh, right now, what I've got is what most people or many people would have if they had the money. I've got a Yaesu FTDX uh, 9000 Delta. I've got an ICOM 7800. I've got an Alpha 77 uh, amp. And then I've got really good antennas. So I I get out really well, really well. That sounds great. If you were looking back on your younger ham radio self, is there anything that you would have done differently or something that you would, in the hobby, that you would pursue that you're not pursuing now? No, I don't think so. I, I've stuck my hand in almost every aspect of the hobby. I mean, I've been on, you know, I went through the slow scan uh, television phase. I went into fast scan television uh, I've been into the various digital modes, uh, so I've, I've sort of examined every aspect of uh, ham radio I can. We've sent radios up on balloons. We've done all sorts of fun things. It, it's never-ending. This is one hobby that will continue to deliver the fun your entire life. I, I'm not sure how many hobbies can make that claim, but this one certainly can. Well, I think you're right. Is there any advice you would give to new or returning hams to the hobby? Um... That's an interesting question. What advice would I give? You know, I, I, I worry a little bit that the medium that you and I are using right now, the Internet, Eric, may supplant ham radio to some degree. But, you know, for me, and I can only make my own claim, um, there is still the magic of radio going through the air. No matter how good the Internet gets, it's not doing it through the air. So... What would my advice be? Uh, I guess it would be discover the magic of radio going through the air. Because we do have the Internet. It's convenient. You and I can talk at thousands of miles, and it sounds great. But it's not going through the air. So if you really want to know what radio is all about, ham radio is the way to find out. Yeah, I usually tell people that when we're using Skype, we're only using a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure. <laughs> You know, <laughs> to talk to from one end of the world to the other. But a ham can throw a piece of wire out the back window and talk around the world. That's right. I hope that sort of magical thinking uh, uh, continues, Eric. Uh, I worry again that uh, the Internet, as, as you point out, uh, seems to be what's attracting young people. But I still, Eric, I still run into young people, even people who are into the Internet, who look at a radio and they go, Oh, my God, you can talk to people around the world on that? Yes, I can. Want to see? <laughs> Do you have neighborhood kids 
that show an interest in ham radio where you are? We do have neighborhood kids. It's been a long time since I mentored anybody. My wife has a license. Uh, she was licensed also in the Philippines, took the test and passed. But, you know, as most wives, I think she did it because she knew it would please me, not because the hobby electrified her as it has me all my life. Yeah, I get that. Well, Art, it's been a true pleasure to have you on as a guest on the QSO Today podcast. And um, with that, I want to thank you very much and wish you 73. 73, Eric, and thank you. Foundations of Amateur Radio On the 12th of December 1961, before I was born, before my parents met, the first amateur radio satellite was launched by Project Oscar. It was a 10 kilo box launched as the first private, non-government spacecraft. Oscar 1 was the first piggyback satellite, launched as a secondary payload taking the space of a ballast weight, and managed to be heard by over 570 amateurs across 28 countries during the 22 days it was in orbit. It was launched just over four years after Sputnik 1, and was built entirely by amateurs, four radio amateurs. In the 60 years since, we've come a long way. Today, high school students are building and launching CubeSats, and several groups have built satellites for less than $1,000. Oscar 76, the so-called $50 sat, cost $250 in parts. It operated in orbit for 20 months. Fees for launching a 10 cm cubed satellite are around $60,000 and reducing by the year. If that sounds like a lot of money for the amateur community, consider that the budget for operating Victor Kilo Zero Echo Kilo, the de-expedition to Heard Island in 2016, was $550,000. Operation lasted 21 days. I'm mentioning all this in the context of homebrew. Not the alcoholic version of homebrew, the radio amateur version, where you build stuff for your personal enjoyment and education. For some amateurs, that itch is scratched by designing and building a valve-based power amplifier. For others, it means building a wooden Morse key. For the members of OSCAR, it's satellites. For me, the itch has always been software. Sitting in my bedroom in the early 1980s, eyeballs glued to the black and white TV that was connected to my very own Commodore VIC-20 was how I got properly bitten by that bug, after having been introduced to the Apple II at my high school. I'm a curious person, have always been. In my work, I generally go after the new and novel, and then discover six months down the track that my clients benefit from my weird sideways excursion into something or other. Right now, my latest diversion is the FPGA, a field programmable gate array. Started watching a new series by DigiKey about how to use them, and the experience is exhilarating. One way to simply describe an FPGA is to think of it as a way to create a virtual circuit board that can be reprogrammed in the field. You don't have to go out and design a chip for a specific purpose and deal with errors, upgrades and supply chain issues. Instead, you use a virtual circuit and reprogram as needed. If you're not sure how powerful this is, you can program an FPGA to behave like a Motorola 65CO2 microprocessor or as a RISC CPU or well over 200 other open source processor designs, including the 64-bit UltraSpark T1 microprocessor. I'm mentioning this because while I have a vintage HP 606A valve-based signal generator that I'm working on restoring to fully working, homebrew for me involves all that the world has to offer. I don't get excited about solder, and my hands and eyes are really not steady enough to manage small circuit designs. But tapping keys on a keyboard, that's something I've been doing for a long time. Another thing I like about this whole upgraded view of homebrew is that we as radio amateurs are already familiar with building blocks. We likely don't design a power supply from scratch, or an amplifier, or the VFO circuit. Why improve something that has stood the test of time? In my virtual world, I too can use those building blocks. In FPGA land, I can select any number of implementations of a Fourier transform and test them all to see which one suits my purpose best. In case you're wondering, my Pluto SDR is looking great as a 2 meter and 70 centimeter beacon, transmitting on both bands simultaneously. It too has an FPGA on board, 
and I'm not afraid to get my keyboard dirty trying to tease out how to best make use of that. What homebrew adventures have you been up to? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. And now, with this week's propagation forecast report, we go to space weather woman Tamitha Skov, WX6SWW. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, everything is in the green when it comes to big solar flares. The only regions we have on the Earth-facing disk right now are regions 28, 96, and 97, and they're reasonably quiet. So we have no risk for radio blackouts right now, and that should make GPS users on Earth's day side very happy. However, they are be boosting the solar flux into the high 70s and low 80s, and that's giving us, well, you know, marginal radio propagation on Earth's day side. And those levels uh, of solar flux will continue to climb over the course of this week as we start getting the influence of those other regions that are rotating into stereo's view right now. They hopefully will be boosting that solar flux back up into the maybe mid to high 80s within about a week or so. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders just hang in there. Solar flux will boost. We might even get uh, up into the 90s. Wouldn't that be nice? So just hold on one more week before uh, things will give you a little bit of a respite. Now, meanwhile, because because we are still climbing out of solar minimum, the cosmic ray flux is still a bit more intense than we'd like it to be. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew who fly over 800 hours annually and fly at high latitudes and high altitudes. You are in the moderate range. This is the D2 minor range for radiation dose, and this does include prenatal passengers. So please take this into consideration in your flight plans. So the space weather this week isn't all that exciting, but we do have a little bit of activity going on. We're being hit right now by a second pocket of fast solar wind from a coronal hole that's rotated into the Earth's strike zone. As a matter of fact, we're going to be hit by this fast solar wind easily over the next couple days, and it could bring aurora down to uh, high latitudes most likely. Mid-latitude aurora photographers, though, you're likely going to have to sit this one out because I just don't think it's going to give us enough to bring aurora down to mid-latitudes for this trip. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you two are kind of a little bit in a lull because the solar flux is down into the high 70s right now. We are dealing with uh, marginal radio propagation on Earth's day side, but you've got some luck in store because we do have those new bright regions that are rotating into stereo's view and will rotate into Earth view here probably over the next four days or so, maybe a little bit longer, and we may be back to having M-flare players. We shall see. So who knows? Maybe that uh, solar flux will boost up into the 90s, possibly even triple digits. And now GPS users, well, you know what? The solar flux is down and we don't have any big solar storms uh, headed toward Earth. So GPS reception pretty much all around the globe should look pretty good. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. November the 21st, 2021 marked the eighth birthday of the amateur radio FunCube 1 CubeSat. Remarkably, the tiny spacecraft, launched from Russia on November the 21st, 2013, continues to work well, having travelled more than a billion kilometres in space. During the past couple of months, the spacecraft's orbits have been running just along the edge of the Terminator. Initially, it was effectively receiving full sun with no eclipses, but at the beginning of this month, it appears that the solar panels were not receiving enough solar radiation to keep the battery fully charged. FunCube 1, also known as Alpha Oscar 7-3 AO73, was transmitting continuous high-power telemetry and was therefore consuming maximum battery power. Telemetry received at the AMSAT UK BATC ground station at Goonhilly Earth Station showed on the FunCube dashboard that there'd been a rapid decline in the bus voltage from an already below normal 8 volts down to 7.8 volts. The spacecraft was switched to safe mode on the afternoon of November the 18th. This reduced the total power consumption by almost 50%, and, as has now been confirmed, the spacecraft is again in a happy, power-positive situation. Long live FunCube 1! The Times Call website reports that as the coronavirus pandemic continues for a second holiday season, some of Santa's earthly helpers are assuring that children will still get the chance to tell old Saint Nick what they want for Christmas in a safe distanced way. After devising a plan last year to connect Santa Claus with children via ham radio, the Longmont Amateur Radio Club of Colorado in the United States is once again reserving some airtime for Kris Kringle. 
Children will be able to talk with Santa Claus from 5 to 7 p.m. on Sundays and 6 to 7 p.m. on Mondays, right through until December the 3rd. Chuck Potch, the radio club president, said that last year the club was able to connect 34 children with Santa Claus, including one from Ohio and one from Canada. With opportunities to visit with Santa Claus last year lessened because of concerns about the spread of coronavirus, the club still wanted to give children the chance to participate in the tradition in a safe way. Potch of Firestone said that they wanted to extend that opportunity this year. He said, I think hopefully it will still give children a little cheer to know that Santa is out there. You may not be able to see him in person and sit on his lap, but you can get on the air and talk to him, and at least you know he's there. Longmont Club's Steve Haverstick of the club's publicity committee said that he knows how much getting to talk to Santa Claus on the air meant to the kids last year when many holiday traditions were stymied because of the pandemic. That's what sparked this whole Santa on the air thing, Haverstick said. It was also an opportunity for amateurs in the background to coach the children in the art of good communication. Santa Claus himself, who is also known as John Chilson, by the way, has kindly agreed to help the club with its mission. And Santa's call sign will be November Zero Papa. Potch said that he believes that talking with Santa Claus on the air will help spark some young interest in ham radio operation. He added that the knowledge of the technology and engineering that goes into amateur radio operations can be used for more than just a hobby, including helping to transmit important information in emergency situations when internet and cell phone towers aren't working. Indeed, Longmont's club, which is made up of 163 members, continues to work with Longmont's Office of Emergency Management to teach interested parties about ham radio and how to get a license from the Federal Communications Commission, which is the American regulator. If you think about it, ham radio is the original social distancing, Potch said. It's over 100 years old. It was around way before Facebook or similar things came along. There's a long history behind it, and it's a lot of fun. Potch said that it's important to keep that history. Anyone can become a radio amateur. You've just got to pass the test and get a license. You can read the full Times Call article at www.timescall.com. You may think that next month is December, and you'd be right. But the amateur radio calendar calls it something else. Youngsters on the Air Month. Each of December's 31 days are devoted to encouraging youngsters around the world to get on the air using the letters Y-O-T-A as their suffix in their call signs. International Y-O-T-A stations will be calling QRZ with operators in their teens and early 20s. Be listening for ZS9 Y-O-T-A from South Africa, 5B4 Y-O-T-A from Cyprus, OD5 Y-O-T-A from Lebanon, and K8Y K8O, K8T, and K8A from the U.S. There are many others, and the bands are expected to be busy as the young radio operators vie for various awards and plaques. Hams making contacts with these YOTA stations are advised, as always, to remember that they might just be that young radio operator's first contact, so make it as memorable for them as you can. France Toir TV reports on a keen radio enthusiast, Bernard Patin, Foxtrot 6 Charlie November Delta, who has amassed more than 500 wireless sets. Bernard has been collecting old radio sets for 20 years. In the garage of his house in Bouquigny, close to the Champagne region of Epinay, he stores this remarkable collection. He spends hours in his garage repairing his radios. The oldest types can only pick up Longwave. Bernard has been passionate about radio since childhood. He said that at his parents' house, they had radio receivers and he could listen to amateur radio. That is where his passion was born. He became a radio amateur in 1972 and then he started to develop his collection. Bernard sometimes manages to receive BBC programmes on Longwave from the United Kingdom, but usually very weekly. Challenged by television and replaced by transistor radios, the old valve wireless sets are counting down the last hours of reception on the long waves. His collection has grown over the years and he now has 500 items. He said that he will buy an old radio set because he finds it beautiful. It's the shape, it's the wood, it's the Bakelite. Each manufacturer competed in imagination to come out with very beautiful things, he explained. 
The retiree is still crisscrossing France in search of any receiver which is missing from his collection. He said that originally you could find a lot of old radios in village flea markets, but now you're more likely to find them at auctions in the Paris region. The other method is to buy up collections belonging to parents whose children are no longer interested in playing with radio. Past ARRL Rocky Mountain Division Director Claude Mayer Jr., W0IC of Denver, Colorado, died on November 16th. An ARRL member, he was 102. Mayer grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, and attended Rice University in Houston, graduating in 1940 with distinction and enlisting in the U.S. Army Air Corps during World War II. Mayer served at various postings, including Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, as well as the Azores in Portugal, where he worked in communications and attained the rank of captain. Mayer told a Veterans History Project interviewer several years ago that his eventual route to military service really began when he got his ham radio license at the age of 12 in 1932. He later was part of Moonbounce History. Through a friend of his father's, he was invited to attend Texas Army National Guard summer camp because he was familiar with the communications equipment of the era. So at the age of 14, I became a private in the Texas Army National Guard, he said noting that he was not legitimately permitted to serve at that age. Even so, for several years, he would attend Army National Guard summer camp to operate their radio gear, eventually working his way up the ranks to become a technical sergeant. As war clouds loomed, the Texas Army National Guard joined forces with the U.S. Army. As he recounted, the various branches of the service were eager to recruit radio operators. In the amateur radio magazines, we began to get these ads. If you'll join the Air Corps and go to communications school... We'll give you $5,000 when you get out of the Army. So that was too good to turn down, and besides, this was a chance to become a commissioned officer. He was discharged from the Texas Army National Guard for the convenience of the service and immediately re-enlisted as a U.S. Army Air Corps cadet and attended communication school. After his discharge from the Army at the end of 1945, Mayer enrolled in Yale Law School's Accelerated Program, graduating in 1948 and returning to Denver. After the war, Mayer joined the U.S. Army Reserve, completing his service with the rank of Major. Mayer briefly served as the ARRL Rocky Mountain Division Vice Director for only one month before then-Rocky Mountain Division Director Franklin Matika, W0DD, announced his resignation to take a job overseas. Mayer acceded to Director and served in that leadership position until 1960. During his Veterans History Project interview, Mayer described how the U.S. had established a series of Air Force bases to permit military transport to Europe, Africa, and Asia. His work during the war years involved the system of communication among those various bases. He noted how HF propagation for polar paths was often adversely affected by the aurora, as well as by variations in ionospheric propagation. The U.S. Army solved this by establishing long-wave communication facilities, he explained, describing how the military constructed LF antennas across the potato fields of northern Maine. Mayer was spotlighted as a super lawyer in the 1971 book The Super Lawyers by Joseph C. Goulden, in which that term was invented. One of his major interests was the Colorado Corporation Code, and he chaired its revision committee for 30 years. The Antique Wireless Museum has released a video of a talk given by Edward Gable, Kilo 2 Mike Papa, and Mark Erdl, Alpha Echo 2 Echo Alpha, about the successful amateur radio transatlantic tests of 1921. In America, at the beginning of the 20th century, amateur radio operators had been exiled to wavelengths shorter than 200 meters, that's frequencies above 1.5 megahertz, as part of a power play by large communication companies and the United States government, who wanted to set aside what they thought was the most desirable radio spectrum for themselves. This left the shortwave wasteland above 1.5 MHz to hams, but in 1921, a small group of radio amateurs performed an experiment that proved hams really had the better end of the deal after all. We now know, of course, that shortwave communication is much more capable than medium and longwave communication. In their talk, Ed and Mark tell the story of the transatlantic tests of 1921, which were conceived by radio amateurs and proved that even with modest equipment, the Atlantic Ocean could be spanned with shortwave signals, opening up improved communications for many more purposes. These higher frequencies had been considered useless by commercial and governmental interests, resulting in the Radio Act of 1912 banning amateur radioactivity in the spectrum below 1.5 MHz. As a result of the successful efforts of radio amateurs in the transatlantic test project, 
Over the last 100 years, many experimenters and inventors became focused on continually improving wireless technologies and devices. The direct results of that research and innovation are the smartphone, smart watches, smart TVs, wireless internet routers, GPS tracking devices and Bluetooth headsets, all of which depend on wireless technologies. Those pioneers 100 years ago could never have envisioned the way society has been enabled and transformed by wireless. For more information, visit 1bravocharliegolf.org, 1bcg.org, and you can watch Triumph of the Amateurs, the transatlantic tests of 1921, by searching Triumph of the Amateurs on YouTube. When volunteers build a virtual ham fest after the cancellation of the Tokyo Ham Fair, they use the platform Zoom. That inspired another group of volunteers to offer a complimentary activity at the same time on November 13th. Only this group used the higher altitude platform, four of Japan's summits. If you already saw the YouTube video for the virtual ham fiesta 2021, you already know about the four live stream summits on the air activations that became part of the excitement on November 13th. The activations ranged from Tetsuya, JL1 SDA, atop the One Point Summit Canon Yama, to Kazuhiro, 7N1 FRE on the Ten Point Summit Takayama. According to a report from WAKA, JG0AWE on the Soda Reflector, the two hams along with Kichi, JS2VVH, and Sataro, JG1BOK, decided the live webcast would add excitement to the free all-volunteer event and help share their devotion to scaling the heights. You can watch it on the Virtual HamFest 2021 YouTube channel, and even without understanding Japanese, you'll quickly comprehend that this kind of enthusiasm needs no translation. Meanwhile, back home here in the United States, hams are preparing for the 23rd edition of Ham Radio University, which will once again be held virtually. Registrations for the full day of forums begins in December. Ham Radio University is set to take place on the GoToWebinar platform on January 8th. For detail as the agenda develops, visit Ham Radio University. That's all one word, dot org. And finally this week, an English rock musician who also happens to be a ham has just signed a record deal that's music to his ears. As a ham, Dave Roundtree, M0IEG, is used to being in the shack, operating solo. Now he's getting a chance to make a solo debut on the air in a different way. Known as the percussionist with the English rock group Blur, Dave has just been signed by a recording label for a debut solo album. Dave has already done a number of film and television scores, including those for Netflix and the BBC, but the album's release next year on the label Cooking Vinyl is going to be all his own show. Music Week reported the deal on November 17th on its website, where Dave is quoted as saying, As a kid, I used to spend hours spinning the dial on my radio, dreaming of escape to all the places whose exotic stations I heard. I've tried to make an album like that, tuning through the spectrum, stopping at each song telling a story about a turning point in my life, then spinning the dial and moving on. We will keep an eye on this and let you know when Dave's new solo album hits the market. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on amateur radio repeater systems, streaming on the internet, or on great low-power FM broadcast stations like WGXC-FM, part of the Wave Farm on 90.7 MHz in Akron, New York, serving Greene County and the southern regions of New York's Capital District. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. 
If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that This Week in Amateur Radio is produced and distributed entirely each week by our all-volunteer nonprofit organization and that we do incur expenses for its future operations. If you would like to support us, you can visit our web for all the information. Our address once again is www.twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the